wonderful man we got on well and one of his congregation came up to me and says pastor don't like you pastor thinks he's better than you but he don't really like you that's all she said do you know sometimes that would be enough just those few words would be enough to turn somebody against the pastor well i didn't think anything about it because i got on very well with pastor price I found a wonderful man um, later on when he pastored the church in Scotland. I went down there and uh, took over the church for a couple of weeks when he was in, but when he went back to America for a little while. And uh, we had a wonderful time out there. But you know, that woman in the church, that woman that said to me, Pastor, don't like you, she got married to this, she got married to this man. And one day as I came up to the church, the man that she married came up to me and said to me, you don't like me, do you? You think you're better than me. The same woman that told me, pastor don't like me, was the same woman that told her husband, pastor McKivitt don't like you. That's what she was. She was going around in the church, so in, so in divisions. Oh, there are some people like that that sit in the church and they cause nothing but problems. They cause people to leave the church. They go up and say, oh, how comes it's always the pastor's daughter that's leading the song service? How comes it's always that one that's doing that? I remember in St. Lucia, um, when I was in the island of St. Lucia, part of the Caribbean, many years ago, I was preaching at a church this woman came up to me and says to me, do you think it's right the pastor should always have the, it's always the pastor's wife that should lead the service and nobody else should be given a chance? That woman, she wasn't concerned about the fact that nobody else was leading the service. She was concerned about the fact that she wasn't. When there are other people, oftentimes people will go to a pastor and say, why don't we have other people preach? And what they're really saying is, why don't you let me preach? Why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? There are people that so divisions. Every offering you take, they will turn to the person sitting next to them and say, oh, they're always taking money. You know, they're always asking money in this church and that. You see that? You see that new car the pastor's bought? They're just so in division. So in division all the time. Criticising everything. Oftentimes the wolf in sheep's clothing is not the pastor, it's the person in the congregation. They're the ones in the congregation that you've got a meeting on your church on Sunday and they'll be inviting, they'll be inviting the members to go to another church or go and listen to some other minister. So in division. The Bible says in Romans 16 verse 17, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offences contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and abide them. Notice them, mark them, identify them. When a person comes up and makes the slightest criticism against your pastor, against the choir leader, against anybody in the church, mark them, you've got a division. If they've got a problem, they should be talking to the pastor, not, so, not going from one person to another sowing divisions and passing on gossip uh, are normally adding something like don't tell anybody I told you people are just gossip are causing division of course they don't come and tell you their gossip they normally say well you know I think we ought to pray about brother because I think this and that uh, I'm not gossiping but I just want you to pray about this particular thing this brother's doing and they're just sowing they're gossiping. Gossip mongers sow division. They will criticise everybody in the church except them. And um, be careful. Let me give you a warning. I'll give you a warning. Listen to me carefully. Be careful of people that come to you and criticise and criticise other people to you. Because I guarantee when you're not there, they'll be criticising you to somebody else. You're next, so avoid them, avoid those that cause division. Because division causes problems in the church. 
I remember many years ago, before I, before I got married, there was this church in um, Peckham. The church got divided over a doctrinal issue. But it was divided between the husband and the wife. The husband took one half of the church, the wife took the other half of the church. Oh, they still remained married, but... Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 25, Matthew 12, verse 25, and Jesus knew their faults and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. A church that is divided will not be effective in evangelising. It will not be reaching out to the community. It, instead of gaining members, they will be losing members. We are to contend for the unity of the faith. We are to endeavour to keep the unity of the faith because our unity is strength. So Winston Churchill said during the last world war, united we stand, divided we fall. That's what Sir Winston Churchill said, but Jesus actually made the same statement when he said, a house that is divided against itself shall not stand. Friends, I want to tell you, stand by your pastor. Stand by the elders in your church. Support them. And when someone comes up to you and criticises your pastor, I don't care if they're a member of the church, don't you join with them. Now, even though I'm talking about unity, and we should endeavour to keep the unity of the faith, I am not talking about unity at any cost. I am not saying that we should unite with everything and everybody. 2 Corinthians 6.14, it says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion have light with darkness? There are some things that we cannot fellowship with. We cannot unite with a brother that's not walking right. Two cannot walk together unless they agree. Let me read 1 Corinthians 5.10 Yet not together with fornicators of this world, or convictors, or extortioners, with idolatrous, for then ye must needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you, not to keep company if any man be called a brother. Now it's, it's not talking about the unsaved now. If any man be called a brother. Be a fornicator, a convictor, a idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. With such as one, no, not, such a one, no, not to eat. Don't even uh, go out for a meal with them. If a brother in the church is causing division, if he's not living right, if he is sowing seeds of division, if his life is not right, you should not be joining with them. When someone comes up and criticises you, they say, no, that's my pastor you're talking about. 3 John 1.11 3 John 1.11 Beloved, follow, that, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God. But he that doeth evil is not seen of God. We have to be careful what we join forces with. Jonathan was a good man. And he wanted to be with David. He knew that David was going to be king. But he kept company. For we read in... 1 Samuel 23, uh, 6-17, to 17, And Jonathan's sole son rose and went to David into the wood and strengthened his hand in God. And he said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find thee, and thou shalt be king of Israel, and I shall be next to thee. But also Saul my father knoweth. Saul knew that David would be king. And Saul wanted to be by his side when he became king, even though he desired that, and yet he kept, instead of staying with David, he stayed with his father Saul. And when Saul died, 
Jonathan died at the same time. Even though he knew that David would be king, he stayed with a man that was rebellious. 